In the ancient land of Macedonia, there was once a boy named Alexander. His father was King Philip, and his mother, Queen Olympias, told Alexander tales of heroes and gods, and whispered that he was destined for greatness. Alexander wasn't just any kid. By the time he was 12, he tamed a wild horse no one else could ride, naming it Bucephalus. He learned about stars, numbers, and battles, and his teacher was none other than the famous wow. philosopher Aristotle. When Alexander turned 20, something tragic happened. His uh. father passed away. Suddenly, Alexander was the king. He looked at the maps of the world and decided he wanted to know what was beyond his kingdom. So, he gathered a huge army and set off on an adventure that would make him a legend. He led his soldiers across lands far and wide. They climbed over tall mountains, trudged through hot deserts, and fought giant armies. People were amazed by how brave and smart Alexander was. Wherever he went, he didn't just conquer. He also built new cities and spread ideas. One of his biggest battles was against a mighty king called Darius of Persia. Alexander and his army used their brains and bravery to win, even though the other army was way bigger. After that, Alexander became known as the Great, a great <laughs> leader and warrior. Alexander kept traveling east, wanting to reach the edge of the world. But his soldiers were tired and missed their families after 13 years of conquest. So they asked if they could go home. Alexander said yes, and on their way back, he got sick and suddenly died. He was only 32 years old. Even though he was no longer there, the stories of Alexander the Great spread all over the world. He built one of the biggest empires ever, and people still tell stories about his adventures. He showed that with courage and cleverness, even a boy from a small kingdom could become great. In the world of ancient Greek mythology, there was a mighty god named Zeus, the ruler of the sky and the king of all gods. Zeus was the youngest son of the Titans, Cronus and Rhea. Cronus, fearing that one of his children would dethrone him, swallowed each of them at birth. However, Rhea saved Zeus by tricking Cronus, giving him a rock to swallow instead and hiding Zeus in a secret cave. As Zeus grew up, he learned about his father's actions and vowed to rescue his siblings. With the help of Metis, who gave Cronus a potion to vomit his swallowed children, Zeus freed his siblings, Hestia, Hera, Demeter, Poseidon, and Hades. Zeus led a great war against Cronus and the Titans, known as the Titanomachy. This epic battle shook the universe, and after a long struggle, Zeus and his siblings, with the help of the Cyclopes and the Hundred Handers, emerged victorious. With the defeat of the Titans, <sighs> Zeus became the supreme ruler of the gods and humans. He resided on Mount Olympus with other gods, creating laws and maintaining order in the universe. Zeus was famously known for his lightning bolt, a powerful weapon forged by the Cyclops. He used it to enforce his will and to control both gods and mortals. Zeus had many adventures and was involved in numerous mythological tales. One of Zeus's adventures involves the famous Golden Fleece. This wasn't just any fleece. It was a special golden ram skin that everyone wanted because it showed who was the king. The adventure begins with a brave young man named Jason. He needed to get the Golden Fleece to become the true king. To do this, he put together a team of heroes called the Argonauts. This team had strong Hercules, musical Orpheus, and fast Atalanta. Zeus didn't go with them, but he helped from afar. He made the sea calm when it was stormy and gave them signs to follow. He wanted to see if they were brave and smart enough to finish their quest. The Argonauts faced lots of dangers. They fought scary harpies, stayed away from singing sirens, and met powerful warriors. Zeus helped them quietly making sure they were safe, but still challenged. The big moment was in Colchis, where the fleece was guarded by a dragon that never slept. With some magical help from a witch named Medea, Jason managed to make the dragon sleep and took the golden fleece. Happy with their victory, the Argonauts started their trip back home. Zeus watched over them, <laughs> proud of what they had achieved. Their journey showed how brave and clever people could be, especially with a little help from the gods. The legacy of Zeus extends beyond ancient Greek mythology. He has been a significant figure in literature, art, and culture throughout history, representing the human fascination with power, governance, and the mysteries of the divine. 
In the cold, <laughs> wide lands of Mongolia, a boy named Temujin was born. He would grow up to be known as Genghis Khan, hmm. the creator of the biggest empire the world had ever seen. Temujin's early days were tough. His father, a tribe leader, was poisoned and his family was left alone. This made Temujin tough and determined. He learned to survive and protect his family in a land where tribes were always fighting. Temujin became a great warrior. He made friends with other tribes by marrying and showing he was a good leader. But he was also ruthless. He didn't hesitate to fight hard against those who opposed him. Soon, he brought all the Mongol tribes together and was named Genghis Khan, meaning universal ruler. Genghis Khan started to build his empire. He used clever and ruthless tactics in battle. His horsemen were fast and fierce, and he often used surprise attacks to win. This way, he conquered lands far and wide, from China to parts of Europe. He was known for being harsh to those who resisted him. But he also made laws to keep peace and order. He let people follow their own religions and opened up trade routes. <laughs> this helped different cultures and ideas to mix and grow. His empire was a mix of toughness and smart leadership. Genghis Khan died in 1227, and no one knows exactly how. His empire was split among his sons, but they fought over it. His way of ruling, both powerful and sometimes ruthless, changed the world in big ways. He connected different places and people like never before. Genghis Khan's life shows us how someone can rise from having nothing to being one of the most powerful leaders in history. Once upon a time in Nepal, a prince named Siddhartha was born. He lived in a huge, fancy palace with lots of fun things to do and pretty gardens to play in. His father wanted to shield him from the outside world and the suffering out there. But even though he had everything a boy could ever wish for, Siddhartha was curious about what was outside his palace walls. At the age of 29, he snuck out from the palace and saw things that made him very sad. He saw people who were sick, he saw people who were poor, and he even saw people who were dying. Siddhartha wanted to know why people had to suffer and how he could help them. So he decided to leave his palace and all his good things behind. He put on simple clothes and walked into the forest. He wanted to learn about life and how to be truly happy. Siddhartha talked to wise teachers, sat quietly by himself, and thought hard about how to find happiness. After many days and nights, he sat down under a big tree called the Bodhi Tree and promised to stay there until he understood how to end sadness. While sitting under the tree, oh, wow. something amazing happened. Siddhartha <laughs> finally found the answers he was looking for. He became the Buddha, which means the awakened one. Buddha then spent his time walking around, teaching people about kindness and how to be peaceful and happy. He told them about the middle way, which is like walking on a perfectly balanced path, not too far to the left or to the right. He taught them to be mindful and to live in ways that don't hurt others. Buddha showed everyone that being happy comes from inside, not from palaces and luxury. He made many friends who wanted to share his teachings. And even today, lots of people around the world remember Buddha and try to follow his path of kindness and peace. Al Capone's Valentine's Day Massacre In the icy grip of Chicago's winter on February 14, 1929, the most infamous mob hit in American history unfolds. Al Capone, aiming to consolidate power, targets rival gang leader George Bugs Moran. Capone's men, dressed up in police uniforms as a ruse, line up seven of Moran's associates against a garage wall in Lincoln Park. Mistaking the imposters for cops, the gangsters surrender their weapons. In a hail of bullets from Thompson's submachine guns, the fake cops execute the seven men before fleeing the scene, leaving behind a gruesome spectacle. The massacre shocks the nation and marks the beginning of the end for Capone, drawing federal attention that would eventually lead to his downfall. The Great Train Robbery Under the cover of darkness on August 8, 1963, a 15-strong gang of thieves ambush the Royal Mail train en route from Glasgow to London. They tamper with railway signals to stop the train in a remote location in Ledburn, England. With military precision, they overpower the train staff and make their way to the HVP, High Value Packages Carriage. Using different tools and sheer force, they break in and offload 120 bags of banknotes totaling 2.6 million pounds. 
the robbers escape to a nearby farmhouse, which they've rigged to self-destruct evidence. The heist, executed without guns, becomes the stuff of legend. But sloppy mistakes lead to the arrest and conviction of most gang members. Although the mastermind, Bruce Reynolds, evades capture for five years, and a substantial portion of the loot is never recovered. The Lufthansa heist. It's December 11th, 1978, at JFK International Airport. A well-informed crew of mob associates, connected to the Lukies crime family, gears up for a historic theft. They've been tipped off about a large cache of untraceable American currency flown in from West Germany, destined for the Lufthansa cargo hold. Led by Jimmy Burke, the crew strikes, coercing airport employees to lead them to the vault. They swiftly unload approximately $5 million in cash and $1 million in jewels onto a waiting van. The heist is clean, but the aftermath is anything but. Paranoia and greed lead to a murderous cover-up, with Burke allegedly ordering the execution of several associates to avoid incrimination. The heist goes down in history as one of the largest cash thefts on American soil, with the vast majority of the participants and the money vanishing without a trace. Julius Caesar was a remarkable man. Born into a noble Roman family, he faced early challenges and showed great promise as a scholar, athlete and orator. But it was his military genius that truly set him apart. Caesar served in the Roman army, rising through the ranks with his bravery and cunning. He conquered lands far and wide, expanding the Roman Republic's territories. His victories in Gaul earned him fame and fortune. However, as Caesar's power grew, so did the envy of his fellow senators. They worried that he might become a dictator and undermine the Roman Republic's democratic ideals. Despite these fears, Caesar's popularity among the common people soared. In 49 BC, Caesar crossed the Rubicon River with his army, defying the Senate's orders. This act marked the beginning of a civil war between Caesar's forces and those of the Senate. The conflict raged across Italy, with Caesar's army ultimately prevailing. Caesar was declared dictator for life by the Senate, consolidating his power. He implemented reforms to help the poor and improve the Roman economy. His leadership brought stability and prosperity to the Roman Republic. However, not everyone supported Caesar. A group of senators, including his friend Brutus, feared his growing influence. They assassinated him in the Senate chamber. Caesar was betrayed and fatally stabbed, dying at the hands of those he thought he could trust. His death, a dramatic and shocking event, forever changed the course of history, setting the stage for the rise of the Roman Empire and the end of the Roman Republic. In a beautiful city called Salzburg, there was a little boy named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. He lived with his dad, Leopold, who was a great music teacher, his mom, Anna Maria, who was also really good at playing music. Mozart wasn't just any ordinary boy. When he was just three years old, he started playing with a piano, and by the time he was five, he was already making his own music. He didn't just play for fun, though. He was so good that people from all around came to hear him. His dad realized how talented he was, so they went on big trips across Europe to show off his amazing skills. He played for kings, queens, and lots of important people. Everyone was super impressed by this little boy who could play and compose music like a grown-up. But Mozart didn't stop there. As he grew up, he kept making music, over 600 pieces. He wrote fast songs, slow songs, big songs for orchestras, and small songs for just one instrument. Some of his music was happy and some was sad, but all of it was beautiful. He had a special way of making music. He could hear the entire song in his head before he even wrote it down. And he didn't just stick to the old ways of making music. He tried new things, making his music really special and different. Even though Mozart became famous and loved by people all over, his life wasn't always easy. He often didn't have much money and he got sick a lot. But he never stopped making music. He kept playing composing and sharing his wonderful music with the world until he tragically died of disease, only 35 years old. Happy New Year! Say goodbye to 2023 and hello to 2024. Thank you so much to everyone. We loved making history stories for you. 
Hope you liked our New Year's special with all our history nutshells from this year. Now get ready for 2024. We're making lots more cool videos. And a big welcome to our new viewers. Glad you're part of the Nutshell family. And we wish you all a fantastic 2024.